Okay, hello everybody. Um, for anybody new joining us, welcome to our 16th annual uh, Chihuahuan Desert Fiesta. Uh, this is our first ever virtual fiesta and so we have been having some amazing um, virtual programs for everyone. Uh, but with our next one, this is actually one that I'm going to be helping to present along with Heather who was uh, with us for our last program. Uh, and this is actually one about our some of our birds of prey that we work here with at the zoo. And so we do have a collection of ambassador birds of prey um, who we, we met one of them again in our last program we met a Swainson's hawk but with this one this one is very exciting um, we are gonna see some of our burrowing owls but first I wanted to start off with a little bit of information while we get them all set to meet you um, and so again this is our Chihuahuan Desert Animal Encounter with our burrowing owls so a quick overview about burrowing owls. Um, they are found in the Western United States and they actually have quite a wide range. They can range all the way from Canada all the way down to that southern tip of South America. But where we would see them, you can see here on this map, they have quite a large range in the US and again that Central, Central um, America, even down in Mexico. Um, here in Texas in El Paso, because we do have kind of a, you know, a mild climate year round, you know, it does get hot in the summer, but it doesn't get super cold in the winter, there is actually a population that stays here year round, whereas some of them will migrate um, further north um, or even further south for, for breeding or non-breeding seasons. Now the burrowing owl is one of the smallest owls in North America. Um, they are very small, reaching about 150 grams on average. Some of them depending on where they're from, they might be a little bit larger or smaller. Um, if, again, looking at the map, you can see that there is actually a year-round population in Florida um, and in the islands over that way. And those ones are actually, tend to be on the smaller side. Now again, with being such small, small owls, small birds, they do have a wingspan of about 21.6 inches, again, on average, um, you know, again, based on where they're from, it might be a little bit larger, a little bit smaller, but they aren't huge birds. Uh, they are found typically in open areas with very sparse vegetation. So we can see them in deserts, pastures, um, prairies, um, areas where there's not going to be a lot of, you know, thick vegetation. And that's because they will actually spend a lot of their time down on the ground and in burrows. So it makes them quite different from other owls. Another characteristic that makes them a little bit different from other owls is they do tend to be more active during the day. Uh, they will, you know, be very opportunistic hunters catching, you know, maybe small mammals, small reptiles, even small insects, um, but they're going to try to hunt whatever they can. And again, spending most of that time down on the ground, that's where they're going to kind of be waiting to catch that prey. Now, why are they called burrowing owls? Again, they will actually they'll make their nests and raise their young in burrows. Sometimes these burrows will be taken over from other animals, from mammals that have dug out those burrows, but they'll also help to modify those burrows as well. Um, so they might help to dig them out a little bit. They'll line them even with different items. You know, they might find fur, animal poop, twigs, leaves, all different kinds of things, even trash from people. They'll find things and line those burrows to make it a perfect nest to lay their eggs and raise their young. Now, something that we have seen from our, um, from our owls is that when they are launched, they will actually make a rattlesnake noise and they'll kind of bob their bodies up and down. So that's kind of a warning sign like, hey, I don't know what's going on here, but I'm gonna, you know, kind of show off and uh, even puff up their feathers, make themselves seem bigger, but I'm gonna make these different movements, make myself look bigger to help protect myself or scare away maybe something, something out there that I'm not comfortable with. Now here at the zoo, at the El Paso Zoo, we do have five burrowing owls. Um, just back in November, we opened up our newest Chihuahuan Desert exhibit area. And so in there, there is a small mix exhibit where you will find a screech owl, you'll find some tortoises, and you'll find Jim and Pam. Uh, Jim did come to us from the Fort Worth Zoo. He is about two and a half years old. Uh, Pam is about a year younger than him, and she came to us from Omaha's Henry Dorley Zoo. Now, something that we weren't expecting to have happen quite yet because in that exhibit we did make them some burrows, some artificial burrows. Well, they actually tricked us a little bit. Our keepers were doing some routine exhibit maintenance and they found that the art burrowing owls had actually dug their own burrow underneath the artificial burrow. And so from that they actually did lay eggs 
and we got our three other burrowing owls here at the zoo. So here is a photo of the female burrowing owl. Again, they had three owlets uh, and they were born on July 10th this year. So they're still only a couple months old. Um, again, there were three of them. So this is our female. I wanted to go and show you a couple photos of her out in the exhibit because she is living with her parents. So she's being hand reared by her parents. Again, in the exhibit, they do have other animals around them. So here we can see one of those kind of defensive postures or kind of surprised, like alarmed, what, are, what is this thing coming at me? But our tortoise was taking a nice little stroll through the exhibit and um, the little girl, she was like, oh my goodness, this thing's walking right towards me. And so she puffed up, she made that defensive posture just as our tortoise walked by. Nothing happened, um, but she was definitely a little alarmed. It's something new to her. She's young, so she's getting used to her environment. Her parents were on the lookout though, just right above her, making sure that everything was fine. But I thought this was a really funny picture to show that defensive uh, posture and that puffed up feather look that they can make if they are alarmed. Now here again, uh, our little girl, she's only two months old, but she is already an excellent flyer. And so while I was visiting with them the other day, I saw her fly all the way up to the top of the exhibit where there are these different kind of logs that stick out from the wall for our birds to perch on. Now, typically our screech owl likes to spend most of his time up there, but she flew right up to the top. So, you know, even with, you know, these animals only being two months old, with these babies only being two months old, they are already learning how to fly and are able to fly pretty big Big distances, um, especially for how small they are. But she flew right up to the top. And this is something that we will see with burrowing owls. Again, they spend most of their time down on the ground, but they do also like to, you know, hang out maybe on fence posts or maybe low branches or lower trees, lower vegetation. So they do like to perch up there so they can kind of get an overview of their surroundings. Um, and also so they can even look out for prey or look out for predators. But she was showing off her wings. She flew right up to the top there. Um, um, to show just how well she can fly. Now, like I said, our female outlet does have two brothers who are now in training to become education ambassadors. And so what I'm going to do is I am going to stop sharing my screen for a moment and we're going to go over to our screen with Heather. And she's actually in our holding with our two little boys and we'll go ahead and introduce them. So Heather, if you want to go ahead and take it away. All right. So yes, Sarah has already talked to you about all the burrowing owls that we've had here at the zoo. And these are our newest education ambassadors. These are Sherlock and Watson. That is Sherlock on the right and Watson on the left. And um, Sarah and I have been working with them for what? Like about a year, a month and a half, right, Sarah? Yeah, about a month and so, a half. About a month and a half. And we are just um, in love with this <laughs> sure. pair of little owls. We are getting to know them getting to know their personalities. And if you can see the one on the left, that one is Watson. And we, uh, he makes us laugh so much because he is angry 24 seven, regardless of what is happening. He uh, was angry from the day we got him um, till today. And then we have Sherlock, who we call Shock Sherlock because he is um, always in shock. Um, <laughs> we are working with them by, uh, we are trying to get them, you know, more and more used to being around us. And they are pretty used to us. They will um, eat from us, so we do feed them daily here at the zoo. We are, have just recently brought them down to two feedings a day, but we were at one point feeding them three times a day. And that is just something that we are just, we're, we're in a way Sarah and I are, are kind of learning here as well. I have, um, I have and Sarah has as well, worked with the Brewing Owl um, before. We worked with BB who passed away a little over a year ago. So that was a, a big loss for us. So getting these babies was um, a treat for us because we, uh, feel that, you know, we, we really miss BB, but we're getting to know BB. I got him as an adult already, so I didn't have to do a lot of the learning that I've had to do with uh, the way that we're doing with these two babies here because they are, you know, we just have to figure out, you know, if they're not eating, is something going on or if they're, you know, are we supposed to feed them or just every, every day it's um, something we have to figure out and it's just something that helps us also with that bond that we have with them. I will let's see if I can get a little bit closer there. Sherlock is now uh, turning in this direction. Now, they are already starting to look very adult-like. When we first started working with them, they were little fuzz balls, and now they have lost most of that uh, fuzz that is covering their bodies, and now they are now developing their adult colors. And they are at about, at the most we've seen them has been, been had about 132 grams. Um, it kind of fluctuates um, on a daily basis, but 
you can have owls that can get even larger. Um, we were kind of laughing at some of the protocols we received from other zoos because they're all, wow, they have huge owls. Some, some of these about 160 grams. We were like, about a, it's giant. Yes. 160 grams are a wow. And, and that is large. Now there are two subspecies of burrowing owls found here in the United States. You have the one that you'll find here in the Western US, um, going northwards and going down downwards and you'll find it on the western side and that is uh, you know we're, we're getting ours and then you have the Florida uh, subspecies and that one you find in Florida and the neighboring islands. They do also uh, do different behaviors Sarah to talk about the rattlesnake noise. We don't hear that as often as we did when we first started working with them. When we first started working with them it was a common sound that they would make. Um, now that they know us they it's kind of sad that we don't get to hear it because it is an extremely adorable sound um but we i did hear it the other day though because i had them in a crate and they were making that sound towards our macaws so um uh, even though they are used to hearing our macaws so i don't know what that was about and um, they also do a bobbing motion and we have seen that with our growing owls and that is something that amplifies the effect of the binocular their binocular vision and it also provides depth depth perception but because of that bobbing um motion that they make with their heads um it's uh, i found this cute uh, what i thought was cute in some of the things i was reading up about them that cowboys used to call them howdy owls because they seem to nod um in greeting from their entrances with that bobbing motion and so uh maybe sarah we can now consider that a, a greeting instead of something uh watson's just angry at us <laughs> not so angry, <laughs> not so alarmed <laughs> Yeah, um, and Sarah, I mean, feel free to add anything. I mean, we're working side by side with them. So I think Sarah and I are both getting to know them in the exact, at the exact same time uh, with the other birds. You know, I, I, I was the one who originated the work with them and Sarah, Sarah joined me later on and she's been a tremendous help with working with them. But with these two, we have been working with them together from day one and we're always kind of like, uh, what do you think? What do you think? You know, <laughs> kind of just trying to throw around ideas and, and what, you know, trying to, and we're, you know, Sarah and I are a great team and trying to figure out how to work with this pair. Um, and it's great working in a team when you're working with two owls because when we feed them, for instance, we each just take on one owl, you know, um, you, you Today's, uh, you know, one feeding, you know, I've got Watson, Sarah's got Sherlock, and, and vice versa. So it's really um, a great way to be able to work with them. Otherwise, um, it would be a lot more difficult. But just looking at them right, right here, right now, they just seem like they've grown, Sarah, from us being in here from this morning, because they just look much larger. Yes. Now, what's really cool about them, yeah, so every day we go in, you know, two, three times a day and we're feeding them each time. We are a tong feeding them. And so what we've done is, you know, typically with larger birds, you can give them, you know, larger prey. But because these are such small birds, we've been cutting up their mice into little bite-sized pieces for them and we tong feed them. And so it is really interesting seeing how much they change from day to day. And right now I'm just watching their faces. Watson is like, what are you doing? Um, but we, we've really learned a lot about their personality personalities, even their likes and their dislikes with their food. We've tried new foods with them. Um, you know, we're constantly learning from them. And so working with, with owls from, you know, from such a young age, we got them and they were about 20, about 23 or 24 days old when they came over to our education program. So when we were able to bring them over and start working with them, you know, that's a really a great opportunity to form that bond early on. And then also, you know, continue to learn about them each and every day. But yes, they've, <laughs> Watson definitely, he looks a little puffed up right now. I am going to be showing a photo um, at the end of the presentation to show what they looked like just a couple weeks ago. So they've changed so much over this short period of time. And they've really grown, um, you know, not only in size, but you know, their personalities have really come out, which has been really rewarding to see um, and to work so closely with them. But like Heather said, we do always consider Watson the angry little owl and Sherlock always has a shocked look on his face, which is something really cool, you know, looking at them. When you come into a zoo and you see the animals here, you might think, oh, how can you tell them apart? Like, what is it that you look for? With these two, they have very different um, almost looks to them. Watson is that little short squat. Uh, he has a wider head um, and that angry look, whereas Sherlock tends to stand up a little bit taller and always has that shocked look. So. Um, you know, again, getting to know them this close, it's a great way for us to, uh, again, just learn more and more about them every single day. 
Definitely. Um, they are, uh, we just, like I said, we have so much fun. Can everybody still hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> my battery's dying, so we'll, ma we'll make it, we'll make it. This is just, my phone gave me a notification, but. <laughs> um, but yeah, they are just, uh, a tremendous uh, pair to work with. And I, I just definitely love working with them and, and all of the birds I work with. But, um, you know, being able to feature brewing owls during this program is really important for the Chihuahua Desert Fiesta because of the efforts that are happening here in our El Paso area and surrounding areas in regards to brewing owl conservation. Um, if any of you have you know, ever heard Lois Ballin talk or know anything about the efforts that she has undertaken here in the El Paso area. She is the expert in the area on working with them here and trying to make sure they are protected because of development. You know, I, I have talked about that in other programs and I will continue to talk about how development affects these animals. And brewing owls are one of those that has probably been most affected by land, by development. Um, you know, I have heard of people wanting to rescue them whenever there's a new building being put up because that's where they like to live these little owls mm -hmm. and so unfortunately a lot of the people who are sometimes building these things are not really being careful with the relocation of these animals um, and that's something that we need to look be more aware of what's happening to them so um, you know at Rio Bosque for instance um, you see the tea perches you see the man-made burrows that are out there to help protect them um, you know I've seen them at the Chamizal the zoo has taken part of these efforts and Zoo and CEDIC has have been very involved in the conservation efforts of the brewing owl because uh, brewing owls, you know, don't be don't be fooled by their size. You know, birds of prey do are about helping for population control, helping keep that balance. And brewing owls do eat other critters as well. They do eat um, here at the zoo, for instance. We feed them mice. Yesterday we attempted quail, um, and funny I, I had not even seen the question yet and it kind of came up so I, the question is does their um captivity diet only consist of rodents having worked with lois um okay so let me let me give you a little bit more of that um we play around a lot with diet so even though an animal for instance uh, if any of you saw my swains and hawk presentation that is known as a grasshopper hawk i have tried giving her insects and she has been like uh-uh i don't want them it's the same thing with these birds. Um, right now they are getting mice. Yesterday we finally introduced quail to them. And I don't know, Sarah, maybe, do you think it was a success or do you think they're kind of needing to get used to it? Because they were first eating it and later on they were kind of like, eh, we don't want it anymore. And then we brought them some mice and they wholeheartedly went, went into that. Yeah, I think it's something that they're going to have to get used to. We've tried introducing a few different things to them. Um, at one point, we tried giving them wax worms. We've, did we try giving them mealworms, maybe, um, or cricket? I mean, we've tried giving them some invertebrates, some bugs in their diet, and they just didn't even touch them. And then, yes, we just introduced the quail, and they seemed to like it at first. It seemed like they liked it, but then as soon as we brought the mice in, they were so excited, and they just devoured that. So I think it's, it is a lot of playing around with it to see what will encourage them to eat because of course we want them to eat and be healthy um but then also giving them that variety so that they get you know different types of nutrients and different things in their diet it's it's kind of just like a it's kind of like putting together a puzzle finding what works and what doesn't um i can tell you another thing uh, zoo animals are are you know we it is different than being out in the wild you know are an animal in the wild may not eat every day you know they may go many days without eating um and so I would think that if I was really hungry, I would probably be more prone to eating things that I normally wouldn't like to eat. You know, we all have our preferences. Um, and I think that if you're hungrier, it's like, yeah, I don't care, you know, I'm not a steak eater, but if I were to be really hungry, maybe I would eat a steak, you know? And so I think in the wild, you know, they, it's more of a opportunistic, you know, you have to jump on those opportunities to eat whatever you find. And here at the zoo, our animals are, we, we give them what's called enrichment. And enrichment is something where we do want to bring out those natural behaviors. And Sarah and I have been thinking up of some different enrichment to encourage those behaviors in our owls. We want them to, in a way, try to hunt. And, and I'll give you, I'll, I'll add a little bit more to that. But with them not liking the inverts and all that, that might just be because they're not hungry they're getting a lot from the mice. But when we first moved them into this holding, we had set up a, um, a trail cam 
And every morning, Sarah and I would look at all the footage. And it was amazing to watch because they do hunt. Um, we don't know what they were hunting. We still have no idea what it is that we're pouncing on. But we did see them pouncing on something where all could it have been a gecko that got in here? Could it have been a bug that got in here? We're not really sure. But they were hunting. And then we have seen instances. We, um, I don't like to move things that I find in here because I love to, you know, there was a little pine cone that came with the dirt, the sand that we put in here, and I have purposely left it in here because we see it move around. Um, we also found a small pebble, um, two different ones that have appeared on a stump that we have here. For instance, you can see that stump there. So let me go ahead and pan the exhibit here so you can kind of, or that's holding. They do have, um, where is it? Right there, that little stump there. They, um, we have seen a pebble now starting to appear on that. So yes. they are moving things right. around. So they, um, they do um, eat, um, they do like to move around. And, and just like, you know, Sarah described, they do do different, they move around different things. And, you know, in the wild, they would even use different things to line their burrows, even to be able to attract other bugs. So um, let me see, you see some questions um, coming up. Um, I guess they fell in love with blood and they don't want bugs, possibly because um, we have noticed that Sherlock likes um, blood, like he likes the, the internal organs, right, Sarah? Like he likes the viscera. He, yeah, the really red yeah. foods, when you cut up that food, um, you know, there's always going to be some of like the skin or the outside parts with, you know, with mice, you know, there's going to be the fur and everything. He likes the really red parts on the inside and um, he'll leave a lot of the other stuff or he'll try yeah. to not eat it until the end. And then another question was, would they eat bugs only and only eat bugs if you never fed them meat? Possibly, but that wouldn't be a complete diet. Um, because in the wild, you know, animals are amazing. Nature is amazing. You know, a mom would know what nutrients their, their offspring need. So the mom would not just feed a diet of bugs, of insects. A mom would feed a balanced diet. And so we need to replicate that here at the zoo. And, and, you're, and you could think, well, it's not balanced because our, all they're eating are mice. Um, they're getting their nutrients. And, and pretty soon I'll be approaching our vet stuff about maybe giving them some vitamins as well. Um, they do get their full body checks. They get their, their examinations. And so, you know, um, we, if there were to be, um, yeah, I really don't know what kind of vitamins they would get from bugs. Um, although protein, I guess, right? Um, all of that has a lot of protein. But, um, you know, for now, and, and it doesn't mean that we've given up on the bugs. And also, you know, as I said before, they're hunting in here. So maybe they don't want the bugs that Sarah and I are getting them and the insects that we're giving them because they're getting them on their own. You know, that could be a possibility. It could be that they're already, they don't need us to give them those because it's cute to see it. We saw it on the video where they were pouncing on something and we, we couldn't see it. We wish we could, but we didn't know what it was, but they were catching something in here. Sure. So they may, they might already be getting all those without us needing. So then we're just replicating the, the other part of that or, you know, adding to that. Yeah. Oh, so they really love centipedes. We have a comment here. Lois has said that they are extremely partial to centipedes, desert centipedes. So maybe we'll have to see if we can acquire anything like that for them and <laughs> try that out. <laughs> Who yeah, knows? I don't know. I would, okay. I would have to see what you know if any zoos and any have fed yeah. them centipedes. Um, I don't know if that's something that would be possible for us. I, I would have to check. Um, exactly. uh, you know, again, you have to just always consider that sometimes a, a, an animal under human care, and do y'all see Sherlock holding up his foot? <laughs> um, you know, it's it sometimes it's a different diet. You know, again, you don't have to. Um, um, you know, they don't necessarily eat the same thing. Um, you know, we, we do try to give them the same nutrients, um, but they don't necessarily have, at the zoo have to eat a centipede, but that would be a great thing. I mean, I'll, I'd have to definitely ask our veterinarian and maybe even ask uh, the SSP coordinators. This is a, a SSP animal. This is an animal that I am the institutional rep for brewing owls, so I do actually have to, um, you know, go through the, the SSPs and, and that, you know, to check that, you know, we, we have to report on things about, you know, population size and all that. So, you know, I could check with the SSP and see if, if any zoo has ever tried uh, giving them centipedes in, 
in the in, under human care. But I mean, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I do know they eat centipedes. They eat a lot of different things in the wild. Um, you know, um, I don't know if ours, uh, as I said, even with buck beaks, our animals can be pretty picky. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, yeah, well, uh, go ahead. Okay, um, I know we've had some questions coming in through the chat. Um, I do want to, I know they're so fun to watch here live. Oh, and Sherlock, he's like, okay, I'm done. Um, okay. I'm going to show you, I want to go just go back to sharing my screen so that you all can see what they looked like a few weeks ago when they were super fluffy. Um, and then with that, we can also answer. We have a couple more minutes left to answer maybe a few more questions. But um, I did want to say a huge thank you for joining us to meet Sherlock and Watson. We love showing off our animals here at the zoo. Um, but again, looking at this photo, they have completely transformed over the last about month. Um, again, we've been working with them for about a month and a half or so. And when we first got them, they were just covered in all that down, uh, those down feathers, that really, those really fluffy feathers. And even their faces have changed. Um, their eye color has started to change. As adults, they do have a yellowish colored eye um, but here you can see it when they were a little bit younger their eyes were like a light bluish gray color and so I wanted to just show that off um, quickly here and then see if we do have any last questions before we um, before we finish here for the day let me see let me show my chat Heather I know that I saw something pop up for the chat but it's not letting me see it are you able to see what's there it says, I had a giant centipede in my bathroom, but sent him outside over the fence. I think they come in pairs. If we get, actually, we even we might need them for our education collection. Uh, so, so yeah, Diane, keep us in mind. Sure. Um, yeah, but we could definitely, you know, we could definitely ask these things again. Um, we don't know if they would like them. Um, our animals eat very well. <laughs> you know, um, they eat very well and, and you know, we, again, we, they could be getting insects already or they could not, they just could not be, it's not part of, you know, what they enjoy. Um, but we would have to see, um, we would have to see how they, they would do with that. But um, they are a, an animal that, you know, just can eat so many different types of critters, can, you know, just be, um, I, I saw a question pop up. I'm going to go ahead and, because I want to make sure everybody gets their answers, uh, their questions answered, is how fast can they run? They can run at about, I think about 12 miles per hour, which, uh, you know, they're pretty fast little critters. And uh, so, yeah, they're pretty good at running and they're pretty good at flying as well. We um, see it now and it's seen them grow up here uh, in front of our eyes. We, we got to see them from being non-flighted to flighted. So we have seen that that transition, and so now it's it's difficult to keep them up, keep them on the ground um, because they love to fly around. They love to show off their skills. Oh, for sure. And they will perch on everything. So right now, the setup that you see is a little. Um, this is actually they inherited this from BB, the other brewing owl we had, and it's just a little eagle which they love. Eagle, the eagle has always been very popular with owls, and this is a, a tunnel that they actually go through. And I just stood it up to uh, during this program to to be able to have them out on program. But I like how uh, Watson already used it as a perch. They also like to use. Uh, this is going to be changing. We actually already installed some hooks here, so we're already starting to change the holding for um, for adult owls. We're starting to to make it different. So just. They'll, they'll perch on that water faucet there. But I think our time is up. So I just want to thank everybody. Um, thank everybody for joining us here today. And we do have, we have a one o'clock, right, Sarah? Who's coming yes. up next? Yeah, so next is Flora and Fauna of Hueco Tank. So if you all would like to join us, just go ahead and click on that next Zoom link. Uh, we'll be starting that as soon as we close out this program. Um, and yeah, I want to repeat that. Thank you all so much for joining us. Like I said, we love showing off our animals um, and especially the newest ones to our team. So Sherlock and Watson are going to be great education ambassadors and we can't wait to show them off even more later. Um, but with you. that, yes, again, a big thank you. And we hope to see you all again in the next program at one o'clock. Thanks everyone.